Well, hello everybody. John Monroe here again for uh, week two of American Empire slash US and the world. Um, so just setting up our uh, introduction for today's lecture and just look at this snow. Quite something today. So winter walks indeed. Um, all right, so I just want to quickly set up the structure uh, as you'll see on the slide as usual the structure for today's lecture in three parts. I figured I'll try to make the lectures in three parts each time which might make sort of three different chunks. They'll be stitched together for the video but you can pause them as you will as you're going through and and taking your notes. Um, so this week then Again, last week, just to very quickly recap, we looked at historiography and historiography in a pretty wide, uh, in a widely defined way, thinking about the way that activists, intellectuals, uh, as well as sort of formal academics have contributed to the ways in which um, historians and many other people understand the relationship between the United States and the world, and with a particular focus, of course, on how this is, in many minds, an imperial relationship. Okay, so we also had a quick look, um, a very, very quick scan of uh, events leading up to the U.S. Civil War. So this week we're going to look a little bit at the U.S. Civil War itself, and to think about it again, as we always will in this class, in uh, transnational uh, context. So you think civil war, it seems it's pretty domestically focused. It's two sides of one country fighting against each other. But as we'll see, the, um, the transnational dimension of this was, was very significant. Um, the civil war, in other words, was a significant event for the United States, that's a given, but also a significant event for, for world history. And in fact, here in England, it had a very important impact, uh, which I'll say a little bit about when, when we get to that part. Secondly, we're going to look at settler colonialism again um, and to establish it as a sort of um, a structural foundation of the United States. And I want us to take away the point that settler colonialism is a kind of ordering principle of the U.S. that the United States is built upon previous indigenous societies but also to get away from the idea that this is something that happened and then concluded, but rather to see this again as a structuring principle, as an ongoing um, aspect of the United States. So a colonial kind of relationship within the U.S., which of course has implications for how the United States interacts with the wider world as well. And uh, finally this week we'll be looking at immigration and um, and the kinds of exclusions, the logic of exclusion that also attended immigration policy uh, after the U.S. Civil War. So, so these are the three um, areas. Of course, I should say, this is so significant. Uh, this is the thing about, about filming without notes. This is easy to forget stuff, and this is so important. That um, as important as the Civil War in our first part, we'll also, of course, be talking about the Reconstruction Era. And the Reconstruction Era, how the United States was put back together, reconstructed after its Civil War, is uh, again of, you know, huge moment for, uh, for, for world history as well. And so we'll look at that. So first part was Cold uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. Second part, um, settler colonialism. And third part, immigration. Okay, I'll pick this up in a while. Hi everyone, back again. Uh, ready to talk about Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, I'll start by saying though that, uh, you know, in the pandemic context, um, my kids are playing in the playground there, or in the tennis court. Uh, in the pandemic con context, we're, you know, faculty are doing childcare and our jobs at the same time. So <laughs> um, I will try to continue with the lecture, but this may mean if, uh, whatever, I have to break up a snowball fight or something, then I may have to do that. Let's see how it goes. Um, okay, so uh, Civil War and Reconstruction in an international context. So let's, um, let me start by saying that um, the, as I said before, the Civil War is a very important event in, in global history. Um, 
And one of the just sort of immediate ways we can think about this is through technology. So um, this is an era of, of rapid uh, transportation and, uh, and communications technology. The telegraph, the steamship, the railroad. And so um, not only is the, um, are the events of the, the US Civil War kind of a major news item in and of themselves, they're also um, the ability for the news to be communicated is 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 moving at a more rapid pace. So we can think of you know kind of like um, a little bit like today, not as fast as today, but still very fast compared to what was in the recent past to their time. We can think of the events of the of the U.S. Civil War as being followed um, in in more or less real time. Um, as as the events are unfolding so already it's kind of an international event and it's being it's being watched around the world so um the era um uh of the civil war um was also international and this is maybe as important maybe more important in terms of you know the fact that okay so of course this war um from 1861 to 1865 fundamentally about slavery in which the Confederacy breaks away from the Union to try to form an independent country to continue uh, the slave system. The, the one of the most important sort of aspects of, of foreign diplomacy for the Confederacy is to win recognition, to have simply recognized by the international uh, community that the Confederacy represents a legitimate country and not a breakaway part of another country, namely the United States. So there's already an international dimension um, in this sense as well. And so, um, so the, um, the Confederacy is trying to get, and here's where Britain plays an important part, is trying to get Britain to recognize, um, among other countries, but Britain is particularly important, I think you can guess why, because the cotton which is produced by enslaved labor um, then is shipped, you know, to different places, but one of its most important markets is, of course, the the market in Britain, where uh, the factories, um, the textile factories of the Industrial Revolution, are producing that um, that cotton uh, into manufactured goods. So, um, so this is uh, a very important international economic link between uh, the Confederacy, uh, the Union, the Civil War, and Great Britain, for example. So um, the British initially take a neutral uh, position. Now, neutrality sounds like it's not favoring either side, but actually the Union, with some legitimacy, sees this as favoring the Confederacy. Because taking a neutral position is already to, ad to sort of admit to the fact, which the, which the, a fact that the Confederacy wants to sort of establish as a fact, c can, uh, to sort of admit the idea that there are two legitimate sides here. And from the point of view of Abraham Lincoln's um, Washington, there aren't two sides. There's one side, it's the United States. Part of it has broken off. So British neutrality on the face of it sounds neutral, but actually it is um, in a way to take, to take one of the, the two sides. Um, so there's also considerable uh, British support for the Union. Um, British workers demonstrate their uh, opposition to slavery uh, and their support for the Union in that sense. In some ways they're maybe more anti-Confederate than they are pro-Union because the, um, the government of Abraham Lincoln doesn't um, it doesn't make slavery a central part of its of its sort of public PR, uh, particularly in the in the early days of the of the conflict. So the Union, the so Britain, like other European powers, watch with interest, um, and they watch um, uh, the events unfolding uh, as the as the war continues. Not exactly sure which side to take because manufacturers you know, who might tend to be more favorable towards the Confederacy, worried about profit. Um, but then, particularly after the Battle of Gettysburg, and it comes to be more clear that militarily, the Confederacy is not going to, to win this battle or this, this war, and is not going to, to be able to formally establish itself as an independent country, then um, begins to 
begins the tilt um, towards uh, the the Union in terms of the um, the the foreign powers. So another kind of dimension of this, and you can see this in the cartoon that I posted the slide, is that this also has an impact for the British Empire. Um, in that, with the with the cotton the cotton famine as it was called, with the cotton uh, production essentially shut down, or at least with the the Union able to prevent the Confederacy from getting its cotton to to market in uh, on this side of the Atlantic in Britain, then um, then this um, means that for the British that the idea of the empire becomes all the more important in terms of cotton production. So places like Egypt, places like India uh, become significant here. And we might think of just before the US Civil War of the year 1857 as, as quite important here. 1857 brings the Dred Scott decision um, which, uh, which in which the Supreme Court decides that African Americans are not citizens. This is an important decision that leads up to the, the Civil War itself, showing that the courts are not going to be a means by which African Americans can find justice. Um, 1857 is also a hugely important year in the history of the British Empire, in which the uh, insurrection in India, the so-called mutiny, is put down with, uh, with um, extreme force. Um, and so this uh, lends itself Lots of kids playing and having fun. My kids seem to be doing okay over there. Okay, that's good. So um, the the suppression of the, uh, the the so-called mutiny leads to a further consolidation of the British state uh, over the the British Empire, and so we can see a kind of greater importance, economic importance of the British Empire for Britain in the context of the the U.S. Civil War and its international uh, outcomes. So that's another kind of international dimension we might want to, uh, to think about. Okay, so um, then during the course of the, the war, the, um, the Lincoln uh, administration does issue um, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, on January 1st, 1863. So this is uh, the abolition of slavery within the Confederacy, and that's not that is not all of the states. Some of the upper southern states remained loyal to the Union; they're excluded here. Um, but it is an important measure uh, that that puts slavery into the into kind of the more of the center. Um, I mean, it, it was about that. There's no there's no two ways about whether or not slavery was um, the central reason for the conflict. But there is uh, a kind of developing sense of the way that that was, that, that was recognized and that was made central to the thinking um, and again to the kind of representation of the conflict on the part of Abraham Lincoln's government. So the Emancipation Proclamation is a good uh, example of this. So, um, so as you know, uh, the, the Union prevails um, in, the, in the conflict. The, um, and the, the Confederacy um, in uh, April of 1865 surrenders, um, and so the United States remains one country. The, the Civil War is, uh, is a defeat for, for the Confederacy and a victory for the North. So, um, so this gives kind of a sense of national self-confidence self um, to the United States uh, outside of the Confederacy. And it's also a way in which another, another sort of transnational dimension of this is we can see the U.S. Civil War as an example of the kind of nation and empire building that was happening um, in other countries at the same time. So this idea of kind of national belonging and nationalism as, as central ways, ways we often take for granted now, but ways that, that people, communities are, are increasingly um, uh, taking taking on as their way of self-identifying, that one sees oneself as uh, French rather than from a particular village uh, or what have you. So we can think of examples of this at the same time. France is one of them, actually. The, um, the uh, Franco-Prussian um, War 
and the commune in France, which is brutally put down, is another sort of example of a consolidation of the French state. Um, at the same time as uh, ongoing uh, imperial um, uh, empire building through the French Empire. So empire and nation are being consolidated and built together. Germany, maybe even a better example, uh, German unification happening in 1871 um, is the beginning of a period of German imperial expansion as well. Uh, the setting up of the German of German colonies, which is of course one of the the key reasons um, for, that that lead up to to World War One. So we can see the United States and the Civil War kind of in this in this larger context of of nation building, which is also connected to empire building. Um, and we want to see the U.S. as again I'll talk about this more in a little while with settler colonialism as colonial within its borders and imperial in its in its overseas reach. Okay, so with the conclusion of the Civil War, then uh, we have next the the Reconstruction Order, and so this was again the the countries sort of coming together, and it just as slavery was central to why the Civil War happened, um, the, uh, the the this also leads to the most important question about the Reconstruction Order: What will the the South look like without slavery as its as its economic uh, foundation. So, um, so this is the question that that is posed, and the Union is of course occupying the South. And here's another way in which this is sort of a transnational question. Um, in or, I mean, it's national because it's within the United States, but it's it's a foreign policy question in that you have an occupation. Uh, initially of the Union Army of the Confederacy. It's an example of nation building, as I said, and also, and this is the really key thing I want to emphasize, um, an insight here coming out of the most important book written about the, the Reconstruction period, which is W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction uh, of 1935, in which the, 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 the kind of largest significance of the Reconstruction period internationally is, is that it is an example it's an example of the possibility of an economic system built around race, around white supremacy and racism. It's, it's an opportunity for this to be overturned. It's an opportunity for the overturning of the racial organizing of an economic system. So um, the Reconstruction period is a period of really deepening democracy in the United States. Um, and of course, if it had succeeded, what would this have meant for, let's say, India, which was which I was talking about before? Um, the British Empire is, of course, also a great example of an international uh, economic and political system based on white supremacy and white civilization and so on. So for the Reconstruction Order to have been successful, if the defeat of the Confederacy led to the overturning of white supremacy, then this may have led to an overturning of white supremacy elsewhere. Um, okay, so um, so this is the biggest kind of uh, issue here. Now, legislatively, the um, the um, Reconstruction Order is uh, unfolds through three uh, amendments to the U.S. Constitution. The um, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, and these all three of them are very important, and we need to we need to know what each of them what each of them does. Again, we want to think about them in terms of their domestic significance for the U.S., but we also want to think about them as again that point as examples of what a larger kind of racial democracy might look like. So abolitionists, as you can imagine, um, were worried about the, the idea that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't include all areas where slavery held, and were concerned that the aftermath of the Civil War might lead to, uh, to something less than full abolition. So the 13th Amendment, which comes in in 1865, um, uh, sort of deals with these fears in that now in the Constitution, so the kind of highest form of law, um, slavery is uh, deemed illegal. Except, and this is an important loophole in the 13th Amendment, except as punishment for a crime. And this is something that, uh, that continues to this day to, to come up as, as an important um, issue. Okay, the 14th Amendment 
um, which grants uh, due process and equality under the law for all citizens is also hugely important. So the 14th Amendment means that when, uh, you know, if two people are brought before a court of law, they should be treated equally regardless of race. And this is, of course, you know, very different. This is, again, another refutation of the uh, idea of the Dred Scott decision and establishes um, racial democracy within... Oh, someone's calling me. Everything okay? Okay. Uh, establishes further the idea of racial democracy within the United States. The 15th Amendment establishes voting rights for uh, African-American men. Of course, the uh, women's right to vote doesn't come for, for decades still at this point, uh, not until after World War I. But the voting for African-American men is hugely, hugely significant. Um, again, as, a, as an instantiation of rights within a democracy, but also because it leads to voting, which leads to the election of African-American candidates throughout the South. Um, and the concentration of population of African-Americans, um, of course, where slavery was the, the, the most entrenched, is then also the areas where African-Americans have the, the largest number of, of concentration uh, of votes uh, relative to, to the population of a given area. So places like Mississippi, um, become places where African-American men can vote um, in larger numbers, and they vote African-American uh, lawmakers to local courts, uh, to Congress, um, even to the Senate. And in the case of Louisiana, there is uh, a governor, an African-American governor, uh, PBS Pinchback, for a time. So this is a, this is a real overturn um, in the hugest sense from the point of the, of the view of the, of the planter class and of kind of emerging white and industrialists. This is really the, the world turned upside down in terms of, in terms of race um, in the South. Okay, so the Freedmen's Bureau is the, um, is the organization that's sort of charged with overseeing these, these new uh, sets of relations within the South. They have a tremendous job, uh, tremendous as in huge job that they, that they need to try to accomplish. Um, and, uh, and while they're doing this, many white Southerners um, are, are hostile to the Reconstruction Order at every turn. Ultimately, they overthrow it um, in the, and this is an important word, overthrown. The Reconstruction Order uh, does not fail, it's overthrown by the forces of, of white supremacy, the Redeemers, as they were called, as they called themselves. Uh, terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, which are formed after the, the U.S. Civil War, are part of this. And so, um, so there's an election in 1876, and the Democrats agree to Republican victory um, on the, on the, with a kind of exchange, uh, the, the idea is that the, Republic, the Republicans can have this very contested election, and through this backroom deal, if the Reconstruction Order ends. It does end, and this then establishes um, or allows the Redeemers to, to come into power and establish the, the Jim Crow Order. And the Jim Crow Order, as you see on the slides I work through, it's, you know, it's, it's Jim Crow refers to a minstrel performer uh, from the earlier 19th century, a kind of performer who enacted, you know, racial caricature and racism vis-a-vis -vis African Americans. It comes to, to be the name for this entire system, and system is really the key word here, because um, this is economic, this is legal, this is violent, um, this is social, this is, this is everything. And, and segregation, you sometimes think of with Jim Crow as separation. It's partly that, but it's much more importantly about hierarchy. It's not about keeping the, the, the races apart uh, as much as it is about maintaining an order between them of, of white domination and white uh, supremacy over African-American um, subjugation. So the, so the possibility then um, that that Reconstruction uh, potentially enables is, is not realized. And, um, and so again, Du Bois being the best guide to, to this subject, the tragedy of Reconstruction is the, the, um, 
the coming to power of the of the new the redeemers and of the the new forces of of white supremacy um, as the uh, as the the reconstruction order comes to a close so this has great significance internationally um, if we think about the connections between you know the imperial and racial ordering of the world and the um, the racial ordering the racial capitalism uh, within the United States after reconstruction okay so um, let me take a break here and uh, see what my kids are doing and uh, pick this up in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. Back again. Um, I dropped my kids off back at home, so now I can walk a little farther uh, as I move on to the next section of lecture, talking about settler colonialism. So, um, as we've seen, then the Civil War uh, and Reconstruction era were, uh, if we think in spatial terms, geographically were about conflicts, uh, of course, over slavery again, over race, and geographically, uh, North versus South. So what I want to talk about here at the same time, um, there was a, an even longer ongoing conflict in a way uh, in the West of the United States. And not confined to the West because this was a continuation, of course, of the westward expansion of settler colonialism that I talked about last time which is again foundational to uh, the, the, the organization of the United States uh, in general. Okay, so we've, we've seen this work already um, in the expansion into uh, the um, Great Lakes region, Florida, Louisiana territory, the northern half of Mexico, which I talked about before. Um, and while these vast regions were now claimed for the United States, the process of populating them with settlers um, and of depopulating them of indigenous inhabitants intensified. So, um, one example of this is the, uh, the wars that took place in the, in the Colorado, uh, region, um, during the, during the Civil War. So I want to think about this then as the, in terms of the simultaneity, let's see if I can cross here, yeah, the simultaneity of settler colonialism, uh, and of white supremacy in the in the Confederacy and beyond um, at the same time. So let me put that another way. We want to think then about the simultaneity and the ongoingness and the foundational nature of settler colonialism and anti-black racism uh, unfolding together and reinforcing one another and also being resisted along the way. Okay, so let's try and keep those dynamics uh, in mind here. So, um, so talking about the, the Colorado Territory then as, as an example uh, of the, the ongoing and sort of meanwhile uh, taking place of, of settler colonialism in the era of the, of the Civil War and of, um, of Reconstruction. Okay, so in Colorado then, uh, Jedediah Smith was one of the early white explorers who traveled uh, through the region in the 1820s and before long settlers, uh, business, uh, interests, and the military followed. In 1851, so again, when we say Colorado, I don't mean sp only specifically the, the state of Colorado uh, today, but also territory uh, well beyond that as well in the, in the larger region of the, of the West. So in 1851, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Sioux, Crow, Shoshone, and other First Nations negotiated the first treaty um, of Fort Laramie, which is in present-day Wyoming, uh, which recognized substantial Cheyenne and Arapaho territory in Kansas, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado, and promised uh, an annuity for 50 years in exchange for guarantees of safe passage for settlers headed to the Oregon Territory. So, seven years after this, in 1858, gold was discovered uh, in Colorado's Rocky Mountains, and this brought in an influx of miners into the region, um, and uh, Denver City was also founded that year. So this is, again, typical of the era of, um, well, the very long era of treaties. They might be signed, and then conditions, often the discovery of resources, um, that, that were desired by settler society would kind of change the equation and of course the treaties were not 
uh, were, were not honored. And let me say one other thing about treaties is that the treaty sort of system continued until 1871. The treaties were not honored. They were unequal. Um, and I'm sure you have a sense of this, but another important um, fact to add to this is that as, as unfair as they were, treaties sort of acknowledge that there's two sides to a negotiation. Um, the end of the treaty system is not the United States government saying, okay, we need to be more fair and more sort of honorable in our negotiations, but rather it's the, it's the kind of negation of even the acknowledgement of another party to, to negotiate with. So the treaty system is an example of, of a kind of unfair uh, situation within the settler colonial context. And then the end of the treaty system is an example of the balance of power moving even more towards settlers where treaties no longer are even something, the pretense of them, no longer something that needs to be engaged in. Okay, let me cross this. It's a busy road, but it's quiet right now, which is good. Okay, let me just get across here before I continue. All clear. Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, the, uh, the, the treaty of, the second treaty then of Fort Wise is signed in uh, 1861. And this one was signed by representatives of the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations. Um, yeah, I need to get off this road. This is a problem that, uh, I think it's called puddle rage when motorists try to splash you when they're driving by. So let me move away from that um, and, uh, and say that this is another issue, another example of, of the treaty signings is that who signs the treaties? So on the one hand, you have representatives of the government of the United States, official representatives. And on the other side, you may just have one or two leaders of a group, larger group of leaders who are not necessarily representatives. So even when the treaties were signed, it's not a given um, at all that they are uh, representative of the uh, larger constituency that they that they sort of claim to to speak for okay so um and this was the case with the um the treaty of fort wise which was signed in in uh in 1861 um it included let me get this right it included representatives um only six out of 44 local leaders were were uh, among the signatories here. So, um, so again, to give you a sense that sometimes the U.S. government could get a few leaders uh, to to sign an agreement, and this uh, would then just be immediately controversial and contested by not only the, the communities at large, um, but also the the other leaders as well who who were not involved in the in the signing. Okay. So some uh, of the, uh, in this case, Cheyenne and Arapaho bands argued that because uh, only a small minority of leaders had signed this treaty, uh, the Treaty um, of Four Wise, that, um, that, that it wasn't legitimate. And so um, it wasn't long before more settlers came into the region. And, uh, and you can see, you know, the, the geography of this um, on the uh, maps on the slide, that, um, that settlers came into the region and became in, in conflict, uh, physical conflict with uh, indigenous um, groups that were there, uh, hunting parties, warriors, etc. Okay. So this is heading into the, again, the era of the Civil War. And so in 1861, as the, uh, the Civil War broke out, um, this uh, diverted, you know, much of the attention, obviously, of the military towards the North-South conflict. Um, but uh, this did not mean the conflict ceased in the West. And so the Colorado Territory was experiencing, actually, as the Civil War began, a wave of anti-Indigenous violence. Um, the territorial governor, John Evans, claimed uh, that any 
Cheyenne, uh, who refused to abide by the terms of the Treaty of Fort Wise, was equivalent uh, to someone engaging in a declaration of war against the United States. And so this is the governor uh, speaking here. And again, this is an example of sort of frontier violence uh, being legitimated at all levels of the, of the political hierarchy. Uh, Evans said, quote, any man who kills a hostile Indian is a patriot, just to give you a sense of the, of the mindset. So it was in this context that, that Black Kettle, one of the leaders who had signed, um, uh, arrived um, at, the, um, at Fort Wise to sue uh, for peace with the U.S. Army. Um, and he was assured of, of safe passage and safe, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, of safety there. And, um, and so his group, so Black Kettle's group, uh, settled near the fort, uh, at, a, an area called Sand Creek. And, um, the, uh, the, the leader, uh, Black Kettle, instructed his warriors, once they arrived, as you can understand, to set out and, um, and get food for the, for the group who had, who had gathered there. But contrary to the peaceful impression created at the fort, the commander there, uh, Major Scott Anthony, had put in a request for reinforcements, and 600 members of the Colorado uh, militia arrived at, at Fort Wise uh, on November 27th, led by someone named Colonel John Shivington. So Shivington was a Methodist mis minister and a, and a U.S. Army colonel, and he had explained that he saw his mission as, quote, my intention is to kill uh, all Indians I may come across. So again, a kind of fully genocidal uh, declaration exemplifying a fully genocidal logic at work here. So his plan was to just simply attack the uh, encampment at, um, uh, at Sand Creek. And some of, um, of the officers uh, present opposed this plan, saying we had, we had um, promised safe conduct and, and safety for, for this group. Um, and uh, Shivington's response apparently was, quote, damn any man who sympathizes with the Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is a right, it is right and honorable to use any means under uh, God's heaven to kill Indians. So, so again, Shivington uh, at sort of the most um, murderous uh, end of a spectrum of different kinds of uh, languages of displacement, I guess we would say, um, that um, that's being engaged in here. So the the warriors who were present attempted to defend the encampment as the uh, militia troops arrived. Um, an extremely one-sided, uh, not even a one-sided conflict, a massacre took place, and um, and Sand Creek is uh, is you know one of many massacres, of course, that took place in the um, the settling. Um, of the, the United States uh, at the expense of indigenous peoples, but also the, the grotesque, um, it, the details don't really even need to be gone into, but, but uh, suffice it to say that the extremely gratuitous and grotesque forms of violence that were enacted on the, um, the people, largely women and children at this camp, um, and then the the forms of display that took place um, as these uh, troops headed back into uh, into the city is really um, manages to stand out in a in a long you know story of um, of different kinds of uh, violent engagements and different kinds of other forms of of very brutal violence. So. So I use Sand Creek as one example. It's one of the better known um, of this uh, of this era. Um, again, that's happening while the Civil War is uh, is taking place. Um, about 130 uh, Indigenous people were killed, over 100 of whom were women and children. So there was. Um, um, an investigation that condemned Shivington after this, but he'd resigned by the army. Uh, he'd resigned from the army at that point, and a general amnesty after the Civil War meant that no charges were ever brought against him. So, so this is an example, one of of many. Um, in Montana, uh, fighting there uh, also continued um, between 
Um, this is us uh, between Red Cloud, another leader uh, of the Sioux. This is along the Bozeman Trail. And so there are a number of examples that we that we can point to of again this this process of settlement, this process of um, of frontiers people um, and the military and the government not always speaking with the same exact language. Again, Shivington being a kind of extreme example, but definitely all of them acting towards the same end, which is to replace the populations that were there with the populations of settlers who were. Who were coming in. Um, okay, so it was uh, it was Red Cloud who signed the second treaty of uh, of Fort Laramie, and it decreed that no new forts would be built along the Powder River, um, and that U.S. citizens would stay out of tribal hunting grounds, and for their part, the indigenous peoples along and then on the northern plains would remain on fixed reservations. So this was another aspect of um, of these encounters was to, you know, sometimes to kill, but also other times to fix in place indigenous peoples uh, in, in, in areas that would be out of the way of the, of the um, ongoing and increasing settlement that was, that was happening. Okay, so the point I want to I get out of these details is to say that this is, um, to show that this is that this is a process, to show that this is again a structuring principle, as I said before, and in opposition to those forms of cultural representation that we see in that time, that this is uh, that's something that is carried out knowingly and, and willingly. The um, you know you see a painting like uh, John Gast's um, American Progress uh, from 1872. I have on the slide there is an example of an artistic uh, sort of attempt to to sanitize this process and so I want to get us kind of away from that um, by uh, thinking about the the actual uh, violence and and bloodshed that these um, that these incidents entailed okay so um, so there were also and I should also point out that there were exceptions to uh, the one-sided military balance of, of forces probably the best example here is when uh, Lakota and Cheyenne warriors led by Sitting Bull defeated the US 7th Cavalry under the command of General um, Armstrong Custer at the Battle of the uh, Little Bighorn in 17 uh, in sorry in 1876 and so um, so this is one example, and it's 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 important to remember because it's it's an example of um, the fact that again this wasn't one-sided. The settlers don't always have it their way. It's not always like Sand Creek, but it's also important to remember because it's uh, it's also kind of an exception, particularly by this point, by the 1870s here, 1876, exactly 100 years after the um, the Declaration of Independence, we have. Um, you know, by this point, the the settlers are really um, are really uh, all the more dominant um, in the in the conquest of the indigenous territories of the West. So this means that um, in the aftermath of of you know some of these military um, massacres and military engagements, you have uh, then railroads coming in, uh, which just bring in more settlers, and again. Um, the, the setting up of settler societies, but they continue to be, as they are today, on the territory of the people who were there before. Um, part of this also involves the, involved the uh, extermination of animals, um, of uh, uh, buffalo in particular, uh, as, as sources of food. This was also deliberate um, in order to deprive uh, people of their ability to sustain themselves outside of um, uh, in, to sustain themselves in general, or to sustain themselves outside of uh, being being forced onto reservations, and again being put in geographically limited spaces um, where uh, where they were not in the way of the of the plans for uh, for settlement. Okay, so. Um, the uh, Alaska Territory Purchase in 1867 is another example of this. So just after the Civil War, um, the uh, 
US is able to purchase the Alaska Territory from Russia. And, uh, and of course, this again means the incorporation of more territory within, uh, within the United States, which of course is not empty. And, and so we want to think about this idea of westward expansion as settler colonialism. We want to think about it as um, fundamentally a colonial relationship, right? I mean, it says it within the word, but I just really want to emphasize this, that if we think about U.S. settler relations as a colonial relationship, um, then this already gets us thinking about U.S. empire within. It's not only the case that if the United States uh, invades another country, that this is some, an example of imperialism. Well, like other settler colonies, like Canada, um, like uh, Australia, the, the colonial relationship is, is, uh, is inbuilt and is, and is ongoing. Okay, Hawaii, of course, uh, another example of this as well. Um, James Cook arrives there in the 1770s, so if we think back at the time of the American Revolution, um, and by the, by the time of the, of the U.S. Civil War, uh, planters have established um, plantations, often sugar plantations, in Hawaii are uh, gaining more territory for themselves. There's also important uh, immigration to Hawaii from, uh, from Eastern Asia, from Japan as well. Um, but the white uh, planter class is, is well established uh, and they ultimately overthrow um, the, the Hawaiian monarchy, um, Queen Liliokulani, uh, in, in 1893. So this is another example of this process um, at work. Okay, so a little bit more I want to say about this. Um, again, I think you've got the main points I want to make about this structuring principle idea and about the colonialism that is integral to what I'm talking about. But let me just say, um, in terms of, of state policy, um, that... Um, the, there's three kind of main objectives, if I want to outline them, that that policy, that settler colonial policy of this era um, is, is putting forward. And one is to motivate settlers to move to the West, so increase settlement, get more settlers into the, into the indigenous territory or territories claimed uh, from indigenous societies. To break up communal land holdings in favor of individualized private property. This is another way to, to increase the the, and entrench the settler presence, and to bring about assimilation of uh, Native Americans who who are not uh, directly killed in the in the process of of settlement. So, I've put up uh, on the slides three examples um, of uh, of what I'm talking about here. I'm just going to pause here for a minute. Actually, this is kind of a nice place to pause because you can see I'm in the city or close to the city center. I don't know if you consider this a city center or not, but I'm at the, at the Legoland. So, and there's a few people kind of walking around. Um, so I'm just gonna stop here so I can uh, be sure to maintain my social distance and just say quickly about these uh, examples that I'm talking about. So the Homestead Act of, um, of 1862 is a great example of the first objective that I was talking about, about getting settlers to, to move into uh, the territories of the West. Homesteaders paid a nominal fee um, and, uh, and they were able then to, to gain territory uh, for cheap, cheaply or even, even for free. By 1900, the Homestead Act led to the distribution of 80 million acres of, of public land in this way. The General Allotment Act of 1887, the Dawes Act, named after its, uh, its, its sponsor in Congress, um, is an example of, is the, is, the, is the biggest and best example of this idea of breaking up communally held territory uh, and, and parceling it to in individual indigenous people. Um, this had the effect of entrenching pro private property as an institution, and it also had the effect of, um, of gaining extra land away from indigenous people altogether because after, the, after a, a given territory would be parceled, there would always be considerable amounts left over that the government would then be able to, to uh, gain control of. So, um, so this program, um, in 1934, when the system, the allotment system was, was ended, um, 
52 million acres had been transferred from indigenous to settler hands. And this is beyond all of the other territory that was, that was claimed through direct violence um, before this as well. Um, and then the Carlisle School in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, founded by uh, John Pratt, who, um, who uh, sorry, by Richard H. Pratt, who, who I'm just making sure, um, something here yeah okay so um, so yes it was Pennsylvania so uh, he and he's the person who gives us the quote uh, to kill the Indian and save the man uh, quote-unquote was the was the purpose of this and this was direct uh, assimilation through the taking of children away from their families and um, and uh, bringing them to these schools where uh, their languages were um, were not allowed to be spoken where uh, Christianity was enforced um, and where Indigenous children would be assimilated, not not to be judges and lawyers, but to be at, to, into into the very lowest rungs of of settler uh, society. Okay, final point I want to make here on this is that, like um, with uh, the anti-black racism that accompanied the uh, the overthrow of Reconstruction and its aftermath, there was a very important kind of cultural uh, logic to all of this um, that. Um, that entailed representation after representation um, of uh, a kind of legitimation of the of these processes. So, um, so film uh, becomes an increasingly important example of this in the uh, in the twentieth century, and of course, paintings um, and advertisements in the in the nineteenth century are a very good example of this as well. So, you can see I posted a number of these on the slides. Um, you know, Birth of a Nation being an example um, in, of course, the uh, the Civil War reconstruction and uh, an overthrow of reconstruction example. Um, I'll say more about Birth of a Nation uh, in a later lecture too, because it's such an important um, uh, representation of, of what I'm talking about. And then, of course, these paintings over and over again, examples of, uh, of the kind of mm, legitimacy of settler encroachment into indigenous territories. Um, and representations of indigenous people who can only basically sort of stand by and watch. Um, uh, so kind of erasures of, of resistance here as well. So take a look at those uh, and think about the ways, like why is this happening? Why over and over again? Why this repetition of cultural representations in these ways that suit hegemonic interests is something we want to think about um, as ways that sort of to a degree, smooth over these uh, these very violent and uh, these violent processes of of entrenched inequality that we're talking about. Okay, I'll take a little break here, and then I'll come back to conclude with some remarks about immigration. Okay, so uh, a nice snowy scene here. Uh, just crossed over to the other side of the canal and gonna loop by, loop back a different way where there will be less people. Let me just orient myself that way first. Okay, I think I can go this way, yes. Okay, so um, then um, from the Reconstruction era until uh, the World War I period, the United States expanded its power um, while becoming uh, home to an unprecedented, an unprecedented number of, of newcomers. Um, and there were several indicators of this expansion, so let me say a little bit about that first. One was literal expansion, and I've kind of been talking about that already. So as we've seen during the Civil War, um, and after the United States consolidated its sovereignty over the territory uh, that was to become the lower 48 states. And in March of 1867, as I also mentioned, uh, William Seward, um, the um, U.S. Secretary of State, purchased the Alaska Territory from Russia for the sum of $7.2 million. Pretty good deal. Um, for for him and for the United States. Hawaii also, as I mentioned, came under uh, U.S. control. Um, well, it was already coming under U.S. control sort of informally through planters, but particularly after 1893, and then even more so, as we'll see, uh, in 1898. But let me just show you what's going on here first. <laughs> okay, kind of nice. Um, so... Um, 
So in addition to this uh, literal physical expansion, a second uh, indicator of growth was of course economic uh, here in the, in the Gilded Age uh, that followed the, the Reconstruction era. So there are, a lot of in, there are a lot of sort of statistics we can point to here. The main point though is that, uh, is that this is an era of economic expansion. I'll give you a couple of statistics just to, just to sort of dramatize it. Um, so gross national product quadrupled between the end of the 1860s and the end of the 19th century. Um, wheat and corn production doubled. Steel, a major uh, indicator of, of industrialization, increased um, from 77,000 tons in 1870 to over 11 million tons in, in 1900 and so on. There's more, there's more numbers that we can uh, point to here also, but, but this is key is that this isn't only um, exemplifying U.S. sort of economic growth within the country, but very importantly, uh, U.S. economic growth relative to the global economy is also increasing. So the U.S. Um, uh, economy is is growing uh, within itself, and it is also gaining ground at the vis-a-vis, um, -vis, I guess, other uh, economies um, around the world. So let me give you an example of this. Um, in 1820, okay, so back in the early national uh, era, the U.S.'s share of the total of world gross national product was 2%, which we should more or less expect. It's not a powerful uh, country back at this point. But by 1870, it was 9%, and by 1913, it was 19%. So this is pretty uh, significant growth here um, in terms of the, um, the world market. And 1876, which I've mentioned already, um, the, the year of the, the centenary, uh, the year of the Little Bighorn, is also the year at which um, exports for the first time uh, begin regularly to surpass imports into the country. So this is another example, another indicator of economic growth and economic growth again uh, in, in relation to the larger uh, global picture. Okay, so another uh, kind of measure of growth is the growth of, growth of the state, which is happening um, at this time as well. And this can be, you know, things like the post office, things that are sort of everyday um, examples. They aren't that dramatic. Um, education, public transport, uh, the military, of course. There are, there are numerous examples of, of the growth of the state here as well. So in short then, by the end of the, of the 19th century, the United States was poised to play a significant, if not dominant, this is still not, not a given, but potentially dominant role in the 20th century. So the, the 19th century story is one of, of a rising power, not, not to superpower status, that comes later. And because it comes later, it doesn't mean that it's inevitable that it's going to happen. Nonetheless, we do see uh, uh, examples and indicators here of, of rising power um, within North America and certainly uh, within the wider world as well. So all of this expanded, uh, all of this expanded capacity did not come about without uh, social and political strain. Obviously, racism, as we have seen, is one central source uh, of tension here. It's also not the only one. The market, I've been speaking a little bit, I've mentioned here and there this idea of racial capitalism and thinking about the, the racial dynamics of, of U.S. history um, as I've been doing so, uh, but also the capitalism part of this and the Gilded Age is an era of, of economic growth and therefore of intensified uh, capitalist relations within the U.S. and as the U.S. You know, begins to project power more and more outside of its borders, uh, uh, um, capitalism is an important part of that as well. So, um, so the market um, creates, uh, you know, more wealth and more problems. Creates more wealth, more wealth and more poverty. Um, and the the Gilded Age is is a very good example of this, um, particularly through the boom and bust system. So, in the 1870s through the 1890s, there were a series of economic panics, or what we call today depressions. Um, which led to a public discussion around uh, this concept that that I'm going to call uh, overaccumulation or overproduction. So factories can um, can make more stuff, um, but if the product isn't being sold, this leads to an economic kind of problem, leads to an economic crash, um, and leads to a number of of social problems uh, that result from that as well. Um, so there were, you know, there was a lot of talk of how to resolve uh, crises of, of overproduction 
or of overaccumulation uh, on the part of capitalists. And one was to expand the market outward, to expand the market beyond um, the United States. And this is where somebody like Charles Conant, who I talked about before, comes in. Um, the idea of the China market was, um, you know, uh, a, a long-standing um, sort of semi-mythical um, idea. The idea being that China, with its very large population, if only, if only business could tap into to this market, they would be able to solve the problem uh, of uh, overaccumulation and be able to find a market for all products. And so intensifying uh, economic activity would lead not to, uh, to, to panics, depressions, and economic crises, but rather would lead to just ongoing sort of seamless um, profit accumulation. Okay, um, and so, so the China market stands out, again, mostly just by virtue of the, of the, of the known uh, fact of China's large population. But other areas are looked at as well, Latin America, of course, and not, not mythically, Latin America is, uh, is an area that, that, doesn't, that engages more with actual trade with the United States, um, and, and increasingly so uh, over this um, era. So this, um, all of this expanded capacity um, within the United States also um, b draws people to the United States. So here's where immigration comes in. So, um, so more people are moving to the U.S., um, particularly from Europe. Um, there's a shift to over the in the late 19th century as the um, the regions from which. Uh, populations in Europe are moving to the United States, shifts from Northern Europe to more Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and the numbers are, are significant. Between, well, they're very significant. Between 1870 and 1920, about 26 million immigrants entered the United States. So um, this, of course, connects directly to the settler question that I was talking about. More immigrants, more settlers uh, joining the United States as well as populations within the United States moving westward um, and immigrants arriving from Europe and going directly westward themselves as well. So, um, so this was um, also provided uh, a connection to the capitalist um, uh, question in that immigrant workers provided cheap labor in factories. Um, and so this was a way that, um, that economic, uh, activity was, was made possible. Um, and also because, uh, low wage workers were not able to buy the products of, of industry also helped to lead sort of structurally within the economy to, to crashes and crises, um, as well. Race comes back into this, um, particularly when we think about immigration from, from Asia, Chinese workers who came, um, some for, uh, some in search of gold in the 1840s, others a bit later who worked on the transcontinental railroad, which again connects the question of the transcontinental railroad back to the settler colonial question in that the railroad is constructed upon the territories that I was talking about, um, just before that were themselves uh, very recently um, in, in the sovereign hands of, of various indigenous societies. So, um, so this leads to, um, the racial part of it also leads to anti-immigrant sentiment. And, um, and this leads to uh, an important piece of legislation um, in the 1880s, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which comes in. And so this begins, um, well, it's, it's sometime in, in, in leading up to, there is uh, anti-Asian um, violent racism on the West Coast, uh, in the US, in California, and elsewhere. Um, and particularly after the railroad, the completion of the railroad in the 1860s, this only intensifies. So. Um, so what's important about Chinese exclusion um, is that it provides, uh, or it, I guess, establishes a racial kind of uh, template. Um, Chinese uh, immigrants are excluded under the terms of the Chinese uh, Immigration Act by virtue of being Chinese. Okay, so this is um, a kind of uh, justification for exclusion of immigrants. Um, 
which, uh, which provides a kind of template that other, that other later legislation can, can sort of emulate and build upon, and indeed it does. So, um, so what we've now established then, and to kind of pull all of this together, um, are some of the, of the foundations um, in thinking about the structure of US society coming out of its history in the 19th century and before that we will want to think about uh, for the rest of the module. Um, so this is kind of establishing um, uh, ideas here, but they remain important. They remain important today um, when we think about, about the United States. They remain very important today, as, as you're already aware of. Okay, so well, let me just list them then. Slavery and anti-black racism, expanding U.S. national power, immigration and exclusion, and continental conquest, um, which these four kind of factors, I hope, will help us to make sense of the, um, the relations between the U.S. and the wider world that we will uh, look at in the rest of the module. Um, and that we will think about uh, in different ways um, and all of the different factors that go into these, these different issues, um, culture, economy, etc., that I've been talking about. Um, and we'll keep these in mind and we'll, we'll refer back to them at different points as we talk about different uh, engagements between the U.S. and the world. Okay time to head home. Uh, so this was, um, well, we'll see if we get anything more wintry than this for, for our walks uh, and, and, uh, and our lectures. But um, welcome again to week two, and I will see you in seminar.